Okay, so now we are going to start with the topic or the subject which has the lowest effort when it comes to comparison with the marks. Well, that is alternative investments. And in level one, alternative investment is only restricted to the introduction. So there's just an introduction of alternative investments. And many of the things that you will be seeing in alternative investment is already being covered in portfolio or derivatives or equity valuations. So if you check out here, the weight of alternative investment is hardly five to eight percentage, which is at par with derivatives and portfolio, where you have so many of readings and so on. So as I said, compared to the efforts and the way, uh, and the weights and the contribution comparison, I think alternative is best bet. But the problem is also that you have few questions in alternative investments. So let's assume that you on an average have 10 to 12 questions or maybe less than that. That's the maximum. So if you have five percentage weight, then how many questions you'll have out of the total questions that we are going to have in the morning and evening session? How many questions out of 185 question five percent is going to be how much nine? Am I correct? Yes. So out of nine, for you to score 70 percentile, the only thing is that, like, let's say if you score six, six divided by nine, you are 67 percentage. Okay. And if you score seven right, then you are above 70. So the only scope of error is that two questions can be wrong at max. If you are more than two questions wrong, then you fall below 70 in the entire subject. So that's a worry. So your one question can change your, you know, from 70 to uh, below 70. Correct. So the lesser the weight, the lesser the number of questions, not the weight, the number of questions, the more accurate you have to be. Are you getting it? So I've seen many students easily scoring 70 plus in fixed income or in financial reporting because there, there are too many questions. But when it comes to alternatives, many students get below 70 because of that one, dif one difference in one question. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? Everyone? Yes. yes. So do not take lightly any subject, even if it is easy to do, lesser in quantum. The more less, uh, the, uh, the more easier it is or the lesser the quantum it is, the more accurate you have to be. Clear? So there's just one reading that is introduction to alternative investment. And that's what we'll be doing now. Now, as I said, many things like private equity, hedge funds, venture capital, buyouts, few of these things we have done in equities and other topics also in portfolios and all. So many things will be repetitive. So apart from that, what is the new thing here that you will see is detailed discussion about hedge funds, real estate, commodities, infrastructure investments, and various other small types of alternative investments. Why are they called alternative and what exactly is alternative investment? Let's see that. So first, why are they not clubbed with traditional investments? Traditional investments are like equity, bonds and all, right? Alternative, why are they called alternative? Because they have some unique feature, which is exclusive investment into risky assets. So the risk component is too high. And then there are various other features also, which makes this a separate topic altogether. That is alternative investment, a different asset class. So they are not the typical traditional investments. How do, how do they differ from the traditional investment? First, they invest in, uh, you know, different types of securities and these securities can be listed as well as not listed, correct? Public as well as private, which can be bond currency, uh, sorry, bond equities, which are listed as well as not listed, right? Now, you would say that, uh, well, if it's uh, listed and not listed equities and bonds, then it is a traditional investment. Then how come it is different? Well, it is different in the terms of that it is not only equities, but different types of equities can also be the case. For example, you have convertible debentures and all. Some people call that also as alternate investment. But here, anything which is regards to equity and debt whether listed or not listed we are not going to discuss that that is not alternative investments so anything beyond that is alternative investments now what are those first of all alternative investments use derivatives and they also have leverage in it so 
equities and debt investment in derivatives is that called alternative investment well in derivatives it's not only in equity and debt right there are various other assets also so except equity and debt what all assets that you are going to face those are already part of alternative investments now why are they different because there the fee structure is different there you have to pay higher management fees to manage uh, the fund and the fund manager is also going to get incentives now that's not the case in a typical mutual fund or an exchange traded fund which is based on equity there the fund manager does not get an incentive here there is also component of incentive fees right second since they are very risky but the risk becomes very low when you compare its correlation with the other assets so alternative investments as a group have relatively lower correlations when they when it is been compared to the traditional investments so equity debt and cash are traditional investments anything beyond that is what is going to be part of alternative investments but not everything is alternative the features the common features should be should be that what they may use derivatives and leverage the fee structure is different they have incentive component and their return correlation is low so exactly what are the characteristics of alternative investments these are the very very important characteristics they are less liquid for example real estate is it easily sellable like stocks no, no. but they are less liquid they are very specific in nature so not every property is the same there is less regulation and transparency like i would say that for the cryptocurrencies there is lack of transparency there right more problematic and less available historical return and volatility data so you will find it very difficult to find data especially for hedge funds or private equity because they are not regulated enough uh, they don't have to mandatorily publish all their data correct they have different legal and tax issues every jurisdiction has different way of treating the uh, for taxes for alternative investment it's not the same across the world they have very low correlations with the traditional investment they have high fees and there are restrictions on redemptions you cannot withdraw from alternative funds very easily especially like hedge funds and private equity they have restrictions there and they have more concentrated portfolios what is concentrated portfolios means their portfolios are not well diversified they may take bets which are very riskier they don't necessarily do for diversification clear right all these features are there in types of alternative investment that we are going to deal with which is private equity hedge funds real estate commodities infrastructure and various other alternative investments also uh which may not be the part of our discussion here but they include fine wines uh exotic uh cars right stamps automobiles antique furniture and art well we discussed about the art about uh salvator mundi and people buy arts and all even people investing in bitcoins and all that is a part of alternative investment these days clear many people do book domains they invest in intangible assets all those are also part of alternative investment they are all high liquid uh, all highly riskier high return potential lack of liquidity and various other things clear everyone so these are the types of alternative investment that we are going to focus majorly we are going to focus on the first five types that you see here private equity hedge funds real estate commodities and infra absolutely clear everyone what is alternative investments and why are they called alternative yes correct yes now let's get deeper into every part let's first start with private equities private equities we've already covered that previously but private equity these are funds which invest of course they invest in a quantum they buy a good amount of stake either in a company which is not listed or listed but the intention is to control that company by buying a stake right so pe funds they are pool of funds of various investors and then they target companies where they pick up stakes they manage the companies uh, they turn around the company and then they wait for the company to come up with an ipo or a better valuation and they exit correct so p funds re refers to one or the ways of investment in the companies p funds invest in private companies or they invest in public companies where they want to make it private clear so they would want to make the public companies back into private now when that's the case when private 
P funds invest in a private entity with the intention uh, of, in a public company with the intention to make it private. What is that called as? Pipes. Pipes. Private investment in public on the prices. So when P funds invest in a private uh, in a publicly listed company to make it private, that's what we call as pipe. Private investment in public on the prices. Correct. Now there are various ways of doing. Uh, private equity investment, the most famous of that is leverage buyout and venture capitals. Now, the biggest difference between both is different types of companies where they invest and the different ways they, through which they invest. Why it is called leverage and buyout? Because when they buy out, when they buy out a company, they completely buy over the company, but use tremendous amount of leverage, leverage or debt. So they acquire public companies or establish private companies with a significant percentage. So they pick up a huge stake and most of their funding is financed through debt. Right. Why are they doing that? Because they feel the company has huge assets, which can be utilized as collateral to borrow or the company has enough cash flows through which we can service the debt. Correct. That's why we call it, we call it as LBO leverage bio clear. Contrary to this, venture capital funds, they invest in companies which are at a very nascent stage, idea or a startup stage, correct? So they invest in young companies and they, of course, use equity as a funding way. But apart from equity, they can also uh, use different other forms of funding like preference shares, convertible preference shares or something like that. So venture capitals invest in established companies or startup companies? Startup companies. Venture capitals strive for growth, whereas buyouts look out for value. Clear? Yes. Everyone? Yes. Now, along the same lines, you have development capital funds. Development capital funds are also called as minority equity investments. They are one of the ways of private equity investment that they invest in much mature companies, which are not in problem necessarily, but they also may be looking for they also may be looking for expansion. For example, leverage buyouts generally invest in companies which are going through some financial issues. But development capital funds, they look, they also look out for companies. Uh, they also invest in companies which are looking out for capex, capital expansion, growth, or restructure, or they are probably entering into a new market, a new product, or a new geography, whatever. So they will enter into such companies they will buy over such companies that is called development capital funds they pick up a good amount of stake in such companies right so wherever they see growth or value both that's where they put the money and they keep up substantial stake so that they get more benefit and they also get access to the board or in the decision making clear now some funds are very famous for investing those companies which are on the verge of bankruptcy which they feel will completely turn around. Okay. Now that's a risky investment, isn't it? So there are some specialists who are looking out for opportunities with companies which are on the verge of bankruptcy or at the litigation process. So they feel that they can turn around such company, right? So typically buying the debt of the mature companies, which are in financial difficulties, those types of investments are called distressed investment funds. So P funds can be of two types, one who invest in development and one who invest in turning around a distressed company. Clear? This company may be in bankruptcy proceedings or have been defaulted on the debt or they have the likely chance to default. The investor buys the company's debt in expectation of the company and its debts uh, that, you know, basically what are we expecting here? That the company's debt will be paid off in the future and will be turning, turning it around and uh, basically the company's value will increase because of the features that probably they may bring into the company right turn around investors by debt and plan to be more active in management and direction of the company so most of the times this type of investment is done by strategic investors what are strategic investors who are expert in the particular sector are you getting my point now it's not a comparison but uh UK's richest person is Lakshmi Mittal, by the way. And what is he known for? What leverage buyout. 
known for leverage bout, but uh, basically we discussed that I think in the past. Uh, he's uh, he he does investment into the steel companies. Arcelor Mittal, the world's largest steel company, is with Lakshmi Mittal. Well, he was from India initially. Then he moved to I think Indonesia. where he started the company and uh, i think he started the company in india and then he moved to indonesia and from there all over the world is trying to and he does buy out companies which are in distress in the steel for example in india he did bought uh, sr steel so what happens with that so he buys out the steel companies which are in problem with his own debt or does with leverage buyout turns around and adds to his steel capacity right so yes. you know that you know it's not easy to come up with a steel plant but if you get a ready made steel plant and only debt is an issue then it's easy to take over just raise more debt and take it over so they look out for companies which are in distress and then they try to clear everyone right yes. that's what distress investment funds do correct now those are the different types of pe funds but within the pe funds now we will discuss in detail of how exactly a leverage buyout works so again one thing is common in leverage buyout that the fund is going to raise debt and then going to take over the company so here the debt which is going to be raised is the the objective is that we'll be able to pay this debt from the from the cash flows that we will be getting from this company is correct so here the leverage refers to the debt and the debt can be high yield bond or mezzanine financing high yield bond means riskier bond correct what is mezzanine financing mezzanine financing mezzanine which is in the middle it's a combination of debt and equity which is which is preferred shares or convertible debentures are you getting me or even warrants are you aware about all this everyone yes we discuss that in fixed income and equities yes so this gives the investors not only an opportunity to invest but also they have the potential to make more money because they are investing in riskier instruments so p funds what they do they raise borrowings and these borrowings can be high yield bonds or mezzanine financing with that money they take over the companies okay so in an lbo the p firm seeks to increase the value of the firm through some combination of new management they may replace the existing management right or they may revise the payment structure with incentives restructuring of the companies and mostly pe funds do what the most of the companies do what they do cost reduction so cost cutting is the best way to turn around a company right or revenue enhancement so in that way they will try to make the company sustainable again make it profitable so that from that profit the debt can be paid up clear it's not easy to do it but probably they have the neck of doing it they are experts in that clear so firms with high cash flows are attractive lbo candidates because their cash flows can be used to service and eventually repay the debt that which is going to be funding uh, for the acquisition clear everyone yes yes now within the lbo if the management has a role in it if the management takes over the company right then it is called management buyout so there are two types of management buyouts first is what we call as generally management buyout or buy in a management buyout is when the existing management of the company takes over the company so let's say i am arcelor mittal and i am planning to take sr steel but if the management of the sr steel itself borrows the money and takes over the company by putting in their own funds which is a rare thing but if they do that it's called a management buyout so the management has itself taken over the company clear but when an outside management which is not a part of your company when they take over your company it's called a management buy in clear yes so buyout means the company itself its own managers take over the company and management buy in means outside management takes over the company is that clear yes this is all about lbos now when it comes to venture capitals well we know a lot of things about venture capitals by now 
and i've also showed you the different venture capitals in uh in the topic where we discussed sl partners sikoa and all that you remember that yes correct so i'm not going in that detail about the different types of venture capital funds and if you remember my discussion about how sl partners invented uh, invested money in facebook when it was only they when they pick up a stake of 10 million dollar for 10 percentage and then they sold it after 6 years in 2012 for 10 billion dollars so they made 1000 times the returns in their investments in facebook right so vcs have the uh, neck of investing you know in early stage companies uh, and they invest in the form of neither equity or debt but mostly they invest in the form of preferred equity right yes to recollect cumulative why so that they can get the dividend later on also are you getting it yes right or they can invest in a convertible bond also but mostly they invest through the form of convertible preferred shares they face a high risk why because not every startup is going to be successful many startups will be successful and many will fail in fact most of them will fail it is said around 90% plus of the startups fail and only the 10% which are going to be profitable they are going to be multi bagger right this is often the case when a company has grown to a point where it can be sold to the public via ipo so here vc is are investing with the objective that the company will be successful and then we will be able to sell the company in an ipo or through some other investors or basically will be able to exit from the company right now do they invest in one company no they invest in, in various companies because they know that many of these will fail so the places where they invest are called as portfolio companies clear so do they invest and stay long forever no they wait for the right value and exit so vcs are not passive investors but they are actively involved with the companies so it's not only the investment horizon can be 3 to 7 years or even 10 years but they just don't sit idle by putting their money like investors they do get involved in the in the management they do get involved in the strategies so now not every investor gets that opportunity right so they do pick up a stake substantial stake through which they get that participation clear so they have a more active role rather than a passive role is that clear right now the important thing about vcs is that the stages where they invest most of the vcs invest at the very initial stage which is called as a formative stage formative stage refers to a stage when the there is just an idea probably now within the formative stage there are various stages itself now those type of investors which invest in the in the fund in the company in the portfolio company when there is just an idea they are taking very big risk right those types of investors are called angel investors so what is angel investing because it's nothing less than an angel refers to investment made very early in a firm especially at the idea stage now at the idea stage it, you just probably have a business plan and you're still assessing the market you haven't uh, tested the market completely right and most of the people who invest in such ideas are individuals or group of individuals therefore they are called angel investors clear right then you have the seed stage seed means your idea is now getting to implement so this is the point where your idea is now being you have convinced your idea to the investors now you are going to start the production of that idea you will start developing that idea into a material are you getting my point so you will need production marketing development research everything this is what is going to be the seed stage for this whatever you require fund that is what we call it seed seed stage investment right so there are various vcs who invest at the seed stage when they realize that the idea has been uh, passed and now we are going to start developing the idea clear once you start developing the product when the pro product is ready or when the service is launched then probably you want to do a mass production of it that's where we do early stage financing early stage financing is when you want to increase the capacity of the production now from the test 
model. Now we go to the production model, full fledged production. So let's say I just had an idea. I means Elon Musk. I just had an idea of EV cars. Now EV cars was not new thing. It was already there since you know decades back also. But the idea that he probably presented or he did pitch to investors was how is he going to materialize that? When people realize that this idea has a potential, at that time those who invested that's called angel investors, correct? Then when he got the money, he started working on the idea and started creating the product. And when he created the model S, right? And he launched that model. That's called which stage? Come on, seed, seed stage. Because he materialized the idea into a product. Correct. Now, when the people realize that yes, this is a good car, so let's go for the orders. So let's say when then people ordered thousand cars. So for that, I need to start production. For that stage, when I get a money, it's called early stage. clear yes now what is my next target my next target is to produce mass number of cars uh, sell it across the globe and make my business globally visible right that's called later stage financing it is provided after commercial production and sales have begun but the company is not listed yet it is preparing for listing okay so it is already selling a product now it wants to expand into various geographies or various lines of products that's where you need money for expansion that's called later stage financing and finally when you are ready with now launching your company for an ipo or global listing you can say that's called mezzanine stage financing mezzanine stage financing is provided to prepare you to go to the public so it's a bridge between you getting a large public fund and before the pre ipo so it's a pre ipo funding which we say you are basically preparing your company to make ready for the global listing or domestic listing whatsoever clear so formative stage is when you are you have an idea you develop that idea and you produce it later stage financing is when you expand the idea and mezzanine financing is when you prepare for the ipo clear so there are vcs who invest different lines or there are vcs who are specialized in one of the lines is that clear everyone any questions anyone no but one important thing of alternative investment is that those who invest in the private equity fund and where the funds invest that's a separate thing but the investors here are not unlimited they are restricted right not everyone can invest in vc not everyone can invest in a pe fund overall right yes and those investors should have enough capital and they have to pay high fees so the structure and fees of investment is very very unique in terms of alternative investments remember in private equity let's say i am the one who launches a fund and i put in my 10 million dollars okay how much did i put in my own money 10 million dollars and i invite nine other people to join me so there are nine other people who Pull in their ten million dollars, so I get ninety million dollars from them. I have myself ten million dollars, so my fund is now hundred million dollars. Clear? Yes. Yes. Ten million is my own money. Ninety million is by investors. Now this hundred million, I may invest in a leverage buyout in a startup company through VC or wherever I want. I may invest in one company or a portfolio of companies. now the other nine investors are not financial experts they have money so they and me together we have pulled this fund but my role is extra i am not only going to in, be an investor here but i am also going to manage the fund so these guys trust me for that right they have just given me the money correct so the one who not only invests but also manages the fund is called gp general partner and those who only have contributed the fund but they don't have have an active management they are called limited partner the name itself says limited role they have a limited role clear so who gets fees who gets fees the general partner or limited partners who pays fees i mean who gets fees sorry general partner 
the general partner manages the fund right so the general partner will also charge a fee to the other investors so limited partners may get returns from the portfolio companies general partner will also get returns for his contribution or her contribution but she will also get fees to manage the fund is that clear yes right so limited partners are outside investors general partners are are the p firm which basically will manage the number of funds so they are the ones who will not only invest but they will also manage the fund right now ideally who asks the money from whom the fund asks the money from the investors right now they normally don't ask the entire money at one go they may ask the money in stages clear so let's say over the next one year i am asking from you all 100 million dollar each or 10 million dollar to be more precise and more practical so you all are going to pay me 10 million dollar not immediately at one go but over the period clear so let's say every quarterly you all will be giving me 2.5 million dollar that's a commitment that you all have given to me so overall what is the commitment amount from everyone for 10 million 10 million dollar right yes but am i going to take it together no i'm making no. it in stages so the overall capital which you all have committed to me is called committed capital which is the total capital which the investors will put in right and it is typical not all invested money is immediately put in it may be invested in stages which can be going around to 3 to 5 years also not only months but it can also go to 3 to 5 years right it is invested as securities and are identified and added to the portfolio now this period throughout which you will be giving me funds you will not giving me funds one go you will may you will commit me to give the funds over the period that is called drawdown period or the period or the investment is called drawdown because we are going to draw down the payment structure is that clear the capital structure correct so the drawdown period is at the discretion of the fund manager which is your the gp general partner is that clear everyone correct yes so committed capital is the total capital that i'm going to collect from you but am i going to invest completely now no no remember there is a difference between invested capital and committed capital i'll repeat there is a difference between invested invested capital and committed capital keep that in mind right yes why because now it's an interesting thing management fees who's going to charge the management fee the gp is going GP. to charge the management fee right how much it is it is around 1 to 3 percentage of not the invested capital but committed committed capital now of course you can tell that you know you have not taken the full money so why are you charging no i am going to charge on the committed capital that's the structure of this p funds clear so it is 1 to 3 percentage of the 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 the, the committed capital I mean, please make mistake here right incentive incentives when do you get incentive when you do your job or when you exceed your performance exceed it correct so here the gp does earn incentive fee if there is some outperformance but if there is no outperformance there is no incentive fee so gp does not earn an incentive fee until the lps have received their initial investment back so how much is the contribution by all lps 10 million right so until my fund does not make enough money where all the lps have their principal back till that point the gp does not claim any incentive but after that whatever is the excess profit beyond your capital the gp may charge you some incentive which can go around to 20 percentage also 20 percentage of not the overall money but of the profit clear right so 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 if you have now realized the gp earns two things the management fee which is fixed and the incentive fee if the fund breaches a benchmark or breaches the initial investment yes everyone 
But see, this is not a mutual fund where everything is so plain vanilla. The LPs are also smart. They say that if there is a loss in the fund, then there is a provision to claw back. Claw back means the GP may have to return the incentive fee. Very interesting. See this. Clawback provision, it requires the GP to return any funds distributed as incentive fees. So let's say last time I gave the GP some incentive fee, but the GP may have to return it back until the LPs have received back their initial investment and 80% of the total profit. So, so, so GP will get incentive only when the LPs have been paid off their initial investments and whatever is the profit out of that profit first distribute 80% to the LP and the remaining 20% you keep clear. Yes. But here is an important thing. Exactly clawback provision. I'll show you how it works. When we do the calculation of it, we will be doing calculation of the funds. Don't worry. Now clawback means that whenever the value goes down of the fund, the GP may have to return back the incentive fees. Don't worry, I'll show you exactly how it works in the calculation. But just remember, claw back. You can probably take back the money. Is that clear? So committed capital, the total capital committed by the investors. Management fee is some percentage on the committed capital which the GP charges. Management fee will have to be paid irrespective of the performance, correct? But incentive fee is based on the performance whenever the fund goes above the investment, uh, you know, whenever the investment is paid back to the investors, anything that you make beyond that, you may have to charge some profit. I mean, the profit is being charged by the GP. I'll repeat how exactly that is work. We will just see in a while when we do the calculations. Clear? Yes. So we have understood what is the structure of investors putting their money in the fund. What the fund does, the fund takes this money and puts it in portfolio companies in the form of LBOs or VCs, right? See, don't get confused between who is who and all. I'll just show you. So tell me one thing, what, how, how the structure works? There is a P fund, which invests in portfolio companies, right? That investment can be in the form of leverage buyout or VC, correct? Yes. And then there are investors who invest in the PE funds. These investors are general LP. partners or limited partners, clear? Yes. High net worth individuals, right? So what we discussed till now is what the PE fund does, where it invests and in how uh, in what structure. And now in this slide, we discussed how people invest in the P fund. What, who are the investors in the P fund? Not, not where the P invests. Clear. Now, again, I'll be, take you back to the portfolio companies. How will the P fund make money? The P fund buys the portfolio companies and then sells them at a higher value, right? That's how they make money, isn't it? How will they sell these companies? Well, they can sell the company when the company goes for an IPO. But does all the companies go for IPO? And did, does the PE funds wait for the company to go for an IPO? No. No, they may sell before that also. So now we'll understand the exit strategies of the PE funds, how they exit from the investments. So the average holding period is around 5 to 10 years. It can be more or less also. The major ways through which the PE funds exit is trade sale. Trade sale is selling your company to the competitor. For example, let's say a PE fund has invested in uh, Instagram. So they may sell Instagram to Facebook, right? That's the best way to exit. Clear. If not, then wait till the IPO. At IPO, you sell your company to the public shareholders. Correct? The two are common ways. The other way is recapitalization. This is a very complicated way. And many times, many times the authorities or regulators do not allow you. Why? I'll discuss you. And when I'll discuss you, even you will not be 100% convinced. But let's see that. 
the company issues debt to fund a dividend distribution to the equity holders are you getting it so 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 equity shareholders are paid back how by raising debt capital to the investments or uh, to the company right so the company issues debt and that debt is being used to pay to the equity shareholders yeah. Yeah. All right is this an exit no but it is a step that company is planning to the investors are planning to exit now let me tell you that many regulators don't allow of this many shareholders don't approve this the other shareholders don't approve this so this is a very controversial way but this is generally a way when you don't have a choice clear then there is secondary sale secondary sale is when you sell the portfolio to another pe company not strategic investor like facebook but another pe company clear and then what is the next one write off or liquidation when will you write off or liquidate the company when the company is doing great or when the company is about to shut about to shut right so not all investments are successful right so we'll reassess and adjust and take all the losses and whatever is the remaining value will be selling off this is generally the value that you get in terms of unsuccessful investments so the most common are trade sales selling to a strategic investor or ipo if not then recapitalization secondary sale means selling to another pe investors or if the company is already on the verge of shutting down then write off or liquidate clear everyone now comes an important thing what are the benefits and the risks well there are benefits why are there benefits because because you invest at a very early stage there is a high potential of valuation right and when you sell it you immediately get a big chunk of money correct and 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 many times the investment is in private entities so you don't have to go through the sec and do all the regulation part correct so it is simpler to execute also is that clear and if you sell it in the ipo you have to go through the ipo process which is very costly but if you sell it to trade sale or to another private equity it is very easily liquidable clear and since private equity funds are regulated or less regulated less less regulated so they don't have to disclose their accounts uh, to the uh, to publicly they have to just disclose it to the authority so there is lower level of disclosures and high confidentiality these are all the advantages of pe funds but the possible risks are that right possible opposition by management so whenever a pe fund comes and picks up a stake there are various scuffles between the management and the new management that the pe fund has introduced uh, employees don't like it because pe funds have the tendency to do cost cuttings cost reduction so they know that many employees will be fired so employees don't entertain them they restrict them they you know create issues correct and there are not always enough of buyers available so limited number of buyers uh, to take over your investments and if you can't sell your investment through ipo then there is a possibility that you may get a lower value clear yes so will you invest will your investment methodology in a listed company and a private equity fund be the same no you will be more careful in the pe fund why because a pe fund is not easy to liquidate it's an alternative investment isn't it also the money that required in pe fund is not small plus you're dependent on that one fund manager the general partner correct and you have so many restrictions so you have to take a lot of care when you invest in a pe fund so that is what we call as due diligence so because of high leverage typically used by pe funds investors should investigate the below factors the, the factors is because of the le- in case of lbos you have to understand the interest rates whether the interest rates will increase or not whether there is enough capital available at crucial times or not otherwise the lbo will fail right the manager how good is the general partner how has been his or her performance in the past right and the operating and financial experience of the manager that also matters not only the credibility but how well they are expertise the valuation methods which we are going to study that how is the pe valued we are now in the next part going to understand the valuation part of pe and the incentive fee structures and drawdown processes 
Why? Because the more and more the incentives there are, the riskier it is. Clear? There will be less money left for you in the fund. Correct. Remember, incentives also pushes the general partner to take riskier bets. Isn't it? Yes. So all these factors and many more should be evaluated or done uh, into taken into consideration while you are thinking of investment into PE funds. Now, the most important is how to value a PE fund. PE fund are private funds. So their valuation is not that easy. Well, of course, for valuation, what are the factors we use? Generally, when we want to invest in equities, what are the ways of equity valuation? We've done that in equity. Relative valuation, which is PE-based valuation. Discounting cash flow valuation, which is based on future discounting rates. Future discounting rates. Now, there won't be dividends because the PE funds don't pay dividends. So it will be based on free cash flows. And then asset-based valuation, which is the case when the company is about to, when the fund is about to get liquidated clear so let's take one by one market or comparable approach comparable approach is like a p fund approach a price earning approach not a p fund approach sorry price over earning so market or private transactions of similar companies may be used to estimate the multiples of ebitda net income or revenue now when i say ebitda multiple which means instead of price we will take the market value of the fund market value of the full fund. So when I take the, not only equity, but the full fund in that case, instead of just taking earnings or EPS, I will take EBITDA because EBITDA belongs to all the investors. Are you getting me? EBITDA is earnings before interest tax, depreciation and amortization. Is that clear? Yes. So like price to earnings ratio, we can also find market value to EBITDA ratio. In the discounting cash flow, you are going to predict or estimate the future. Instead of dividends, we are going to estimate the future. FCFF, free cash flow to the firm or FCFE. Do you recollect this from financial reporting? Yes. Right. You will predict that you will discount them by the cost of capital or the cost of equity with respect to the growth rate and that's where you will get the value of the fund. An asset based valuation approach is nothing but the NAV approach, which is total assets minus total liability. Minus total, liability. total assets based on market value. So you're the either the liquidation value or the fair market value will be used. If your company is shutting down, take the liquidation value. If the company is not shutting down, take the fair market value, right? Can be used whichever is lower, which should be determined, right? Uh, so I'll repeat either the liquidation values or fair market values of assets can be used in liquidation uh, in, can be used. Liquidation values will be lower. Yes, can be used. This is the next point. Liquidation values will be lower as they are values that could be realized quickly in a situation of when is the company going to get liquidated in the situation of financial distress or termination of the company. And what are we going to do? We are going to subtract the total of uh, liabilities from assets and whatever is the remaining value is we call as net asset value clear yes right. that is the approach now this is the rarely used approach this is only used in the case of liquidation otherwise you can rely on market approach or market comparable approach or discounting cash flow approach. so let's take a valuation here a private equity fund is considering investment in u.s retail company that had a beta of 300 million so you are planning to invest in a company which has an EBIT of 300, 300 million. Uh, probably I can say this company is not listed because if this was listed, I would have directly got its value. Right? Yes. Now EBIT and market values for three traded US companies. So they have given me the value of the three already listed companies in the same industry are given. So I have EBITDA and market value. Calculate the market value of US retail company. Now, guys, out of these three companies, they are in the same industry. I will get the average industry average market value to EBITDA ratio. Am I correct? Clear? Yes. Can I do that for the three companies? 
And if I multiply that with the EBITDA of this US retail company, which I'm looking for, then I can get the market value of this US company, isn't it? Yes. It's like, you know what? You take the P ratio of the industry, multiply the earnings of your company and you get the price of the company that you're looking for, isn't it? So here, let me take the EBITDA multiple of all these companies. What is EBITDA multiple? I'll take the market value, divide by the EBITDA. I'll take the market value, divide by the EBITDA. I'll take the market value of the third company, divide by the EBITDA. Now, these are the EBITDA multiples. I'll take the average of all three, simple average. So 9.5 plus 11 plus 8.8. .8 divide by three let me know if this is correct nine point seven yes. so this x this many times should be the value of the company for one ebitda now how much ebitda do we have for the company that we are looking at 300 so i'll multiply this with 300 that's why it's called multiplier you multiply it with the ebitda of 300 so you'll get 2930.01 million dollars it's million dollar right it's dollar million so that must be the valuation of the company that we're looking at is that clear right yes what did i do i multiplied i multiplied the industry average multiplier with the ebitda of the company clear Well, you don't have to go with the discounting cash flow because that is already covered in equity. So they are just trying to tell you that what is the way that you do well. It's exactly the same that you do in equity. Correct. Any questions till now? No. So this is how P funds are valued or the portfolio companies where the P funds invest is valued. Clear. Now, I have to show you the way the investors, when they invest, in the PE fund, how do they get the returns? So we are, we have not seen the one part of the returns. We are seeing the other part. What do I mean by one part and other part? Basically, if you realize this structure, which I have showed you, what did we just do? We did the valuation of portfolio companies where the PE is investing, right? But what about the people who are investing in the PE fund? How do they get their returns? What is their net returns? We haven't discussed that, right? Yes. That we will be discussing now, but the method is exactly same for hedge funds also. Because hedge funds also have the same structure of incentive fees. They also have a general partner or a limited partner. And they also have a clawback provision and various other things. So what we'll be doing is that we'll be discussing about hedge funds and then when we will be calculating returns of the hedge funds, in that case, the P fund structure and the hedge fund structure, since both are same, that's where we will be doing the different types of fees and we will be doing the valuation and calculation of returns for hedge funds, which is exactly same for the P funds also. Clear? So hold on till that time. Okay. Now, what is hedge funds? Hedge funds are like mutual funds, but here... The, you do not have unlimited investors, not anyone and everyone can invest. The investment is not into diversified portfolios. It can be into concentrated portfolios. You don't have the restriction from SEC for, you don't have the uh, strict regulation from SEC. So you can invest in any instruments. Hedge funds invest in derivatives. They invest in long, short. They do also short strategies. They take unlimited risks. Clear? Their focus is maximization of returns. They don't care too much about risk. They deliberately take more risk. So a lot of students tell me that why is it called hedge funds? Well, honestly, there's nothing related to hedging. It is called hedge funds because mostly hedge funds take bets where they do long as well as shorts. Ideally, when we do long and short, we assume that the risk is zero, right? Yes. But that's only the case when you're doing in the same asset or the same security. But if you're doing long in one security and short in another security, then it's not hedging. Clear. 
So a typical hedge fund, right? They aggressively manage portfolios. They take leverage. They take short position. They use derivatives. They take all types of risk because their only objective is to earn highest returns. Their returns can be absolute or relative, like what we studied in IPS. Private investment partnership. They are open to limited partner with large ticket investments. So they are not open for everyone, and they require huge investment from individual investors. When the investors put in the money, can they withdraw at any time like mutual funds? No, they do have restrictions which are called as lockup periods or notice period. So you cannot pull out the money before the lockup period, and whenever you want to withdraw, you have to give a notice period. Like you can't leave the job. Are you getting it? Yes. Why? Otherwise, the fund will derail, isn't it? Now, before I discuss the fund of fund, let me tell you what are the different types of hedge funds, and then I'll come back to that. So, hedge funds are like mutual funds. So, the types are dependent on where they invest. So, your more or less the hedge fund classification is what is their investment theme? Okay, so it's not different structure as such. It's different investment ideology, which is what defines different types of hedge funds. Are you getting my point? Right? So there are four broad categories. First is event-driven fund strategies or event-driven strategies. Then you have relative value strategies. Then you have macro strategies, which depend on the macroeconomy. And then you have equity hedge fund strategies. I'll connect both. I mean, I'll connect not both, but all of them. So first, event-driven strategies. The name itself says you something. What? Very easy. Event wait. They wait for event. They bet on the event. So they enter before they feel that there will be an event. For example, merger arbitrage. Merger arbitrage. Well, they are waiting for a merger to happen. So they invest in a company which is being acquired. That is called the target company, and they may sell the stock of the company which is, which is taking over the company. Taking over is the acquirer. So they may have any strategy based on their expectation, but they enter when they expect a merger to happen. Clear. Similarly, distressed restructuring. They buy the company which they feel come out will come out of the financial distress. Right, so they do their analysis and they think that there is a possibility of successful restructuring. Then they invest in the company. Clear. Activist shareholders they buy sufficient shares to influence a company's policies, so that they can make big decisions during the AGM. As I told you, many activist investors you recollect that one of that was Carl Icahn. He's a very famous activist investor who has invested in Apple, right? We have discussed that. If you don't remember, I'll show you that slide also. With I had put up the pictures of all activist investors, right? No. Yes. Yes. Should I recollect? I'll the show. game. Yeah. What the? Uh, even on the, uh, on the through website, right. there is the. Price of a stock. Yeah, yeah, the GameStop one. GameStop, yeah. Correct, correct, correct. So uh, through Reddit, by the way. Reddit, yes, Reddit. Since that time we discussed the various types of activist investors, right? Yes. So they buy enough stake and then they other they tell others also to join and then they influence the board decisions. Okay. Yes. So that's what they do. Then there are special situation funds. What does this special situation funds do? Sorry. The special situation funds invest in securities that they feel are going to issue or repurchase securities, spinning off dividends, selling assets, or distributing capital. So they these are the funds which are waiting for the company to do some big strategic decisions, and based on that they will invest before that. Okay, so these are companies which are waiting for some big events to happen. They analyze the events and they put in the money before that. Clear. Those are even driven uh, driven hedge funds, correct? Now you have relative value strategies. Relative value means here you are going to compare the value between two things. 
you will be long in one and short in another so you will buy a security and sell a security sell short in the relative value i'll i'll uh, basically they are betting on the price discrepancy i'll show you how for example convertible arbitrage fixed income now it fits a convertible bond right now it's a bond later on it will become equity right after conversion yes so they are looking out for opportunities between the bond convertible bond and its equity right so they may buy one and then they may sell another so they are looking for they are trying to exploit the opportunities between the bond and its equity clear same goes with asset backed securities they are looking out for opportunities into the underlying asset and the asset which is being securitized which can be mortgage backed securities clear general fixed income is very easy basically they are looking out for opportunities between different types of fixed income securities so they exploit pricing differences or discrepancies between fixed income securities of various types so let's say they feel that a triple a bond is expected to downgrade so they may sell that and a double a bond is expected to upgrade so they may buy that correct same way volatility if they feel that the volatilities will change so they will probably buy one and sell another where they feel the volatilities will change especially with options you know that when the volatility increases the value of call and put both increases right increases so if they feel that the volatility for one call will increase and other will decrease so they will buy this and they will sell another clear and then you have multi strategies where there can be a plethora of strategies which may not fit in the above criteria right so they exploit discrepancies among securities in asset class which are different from the ones which we have listed here now does anywhere here you feel that there is no risk well there is substantial risk clear so event driven or relative value relative value basically they buy one and sell another okay clear everyone macro strategies macro strategies are hedge funds who wait for the global events so they wait for global macro economic trends and accordingly they do long or short in equities fixed income currencies or commodities for example let's say there is a meeting of opec so i feel the crude prices will increase so i buy crude but i feel the gold price will decrease so i sell gold that's what hedge funds do they bet on the global events clear right they bet on the inflation the interest rate data and so on and they can bet on any security that's what they do is that clear yes. finally you have equity hedge fund strategies they are the ones who try to seek profit from long or short positions in publicly traded equities until now you were discussing about any type of instrument but here the focus is publicly traded securities correct so publicly traded equities and derivatives with the equities as their underlying asset so here i will take one position in listed stock and another position in their derivatives is that clear so one of that strategies market neutral market neutral neutral means the risk has to be zero okay now market neutral is a very unique strategy will that's where they believe that they will basically let's say if the underlying is overvalued they will sell that and they may buy option or future which they feel is uh, uh sorry yeah they, which they feel is undervalued so market neutral use technical or fundamental analysis to select securities which are undervalued which we will long and select overvalued securities which we will short in an amount which is equal or in the risk which is equal or in the beta which is equal so basically your net beta will be zero clear correct so it can be in equal amounts of profit or it can be equal exposure equal amount 100 dollar of long and 100 dollar of short but equal exposure can be can be can be let's say if i'm buying a 1.25 beta stock i will be selling a 1.25 beta stock so my net beta will be zero weighted average beta should be zero clear everyone 
Yes, anyone, any questions? Then you have two other types of strategy, which is fundamental growth and fundamental value. So what does fundamental growth and value do? Fundamental growth uses fundamental analysis. They find high growth companies. They buy securities of those companies, right? Which they feel will have tremendous growth potential and fundamental value investors. They buy, they buy basically those stocks, which they feel are undervalued based on some fundamental analysis. So here there's a difference in picking up stock. It's not a complete different structure as such. It's just a difference in style. Are you getting my point? Clear. Then today you have quant based funds, quant based hedge funds. So they will buy undervalued and overvalued security based on, based on some technical analysis. Clear. And finally you have short bias. Short buyers are hedge funds, which will have more position in the short than long. They don't want to be market neutral. Are you getting my point? So they may invest either only in shorting of the securities or even if they want to do long, the long will be very small compared to the short. So the net exposure is short. Are you getting my point? Their net exposure is short. Mostly people who have made huge money from the subprime crisis, John Paulson and all, they have made money by shorting the derivative contracts or mortgage-backed securities. Most of the people that I know who have been billionaires in the recent years have actually not been by buying the shares, but by being selling the securities. So even that is possible. Clear? Now, most of the hedge funds initially start with one famous strategy that they are expert into. But over the period, they try to bring in other strategies also, and then they become a full-fledged multi-strategy hedge fund. Clear. So most of the hedge funds may initially start with one or two strategies, but over the period, they explore and become a fund which has multiple strategies. Clear. Right. Everyone. Yes. Now let's understand the fee structure of hedge fund, which is very much similar to the private equity funds, but here it is more uh, elaborative and more detailed. Now, the common fee structure for a hedge fund is 2 and 20. 2 means 2 is the fixed fee and 20 is the incentive. So 2 is the management fee and 20 is the incentive fee. Is that clear? Correct, correct. The fee structure will specify the incentive fees only earned after the fund achieves a specified return known as, what is it known as? hurdle rate that's your some specified fixed return is that clear for example if i say that i want the fund to achieve at least 15 percent so anything beyond 15 percent will qualify for incentive clear everyone yes now the incentive fee can be based on returns in excess of the hurdle rate correct that incentive fees in excess of hurdle rate means let's say the fund is 100 and the fund has reached to 120 and the hurdle rate was 15 percentage so what will be the incentive on very interesting what was the fund's value 100 the hurdle rate is 15 percentage that means the fund has to achieve at least 15 percentage. Am I correct? Now, if the fund's value is 120, has it breached the hurdle rate? Yes. It has breached the hurdle rate. Am I correct? Yes. Now, by what amount has it breached? I will say one component is 115 and the other component is five sorry 115 and five now what will be the incentive let's say the incentive is 20 percentage so ideally the incentive should be on on what five dollars five dollars yeah. above the hurdle right, right? Above the hurdle. so 20 percent of five will be one correct 
now there are some funds which may after you reach the after you breach the hurdle rate they may give you incentive not only on five but they may give incentive on entire gain which is how much 20 isn't 20. it now if i take 20 percent of 20 it will be four right this is much higher isn't it now if you are an investor in the hedge fund you want the incentives to be on excess of hurdle rate or the entire amount of profit entire. if you are an investor no. will you pay the investor 4 million or 1 million what is that you 1, one million 1 million right now this is called hard hurdle that 1 million is called hard hurdle and when the incentive is on the entire profit or entire returns, whenever it breaches the hurdle rate, that is called soft hurdle. Clear. So now read this. The incentive fee can be based on return in excess of hurdle rate. That's called hard hurdle or entire return, which is called soft hurdle. Remember this, this will come in the calculation. So if it's on entire $20, it is soft hurdle. You are very soft. Okay. You're giving away good to your, you like charity, but if it is only on that excess, then it's a hard order. Then you are a true Indian, isn't it? Okay. So what, how will I come to know whether it's a hard order or, or not? Well, everything will be disclosed before you invest into the fund. Correct. So, so basically uh, the fee structure may specify that before an incentive fee is paid, Following a year in which the fund's value will be declined, the fund's value must return to a previous high water mark. Oh, wow. What is high water mark? Now, first of all, I will discuss that with the example, by the way. But high water mark is the highest value of the fund. Until your fund does not breach that value, you will not get an incentive. You will not get an incentive. For example, let me show you this. Let's say your funds value right now is hundred dollars. I will put right now the funds value is hundred dollars. Okay. Now the fund increased in value. It went to 120. Correct. Uh, if it is to 120, that's a level that you have reached. You may get some incentive because it has reached, let's say above 15%. So you may get incentive. Correct. Yes. Now the fund goes in value down. Let's say the fund goes to 112. But in the next year, the fund goes to 118. Should I get incentive? Should I get incentive? Yes. No, that's called high watermark. High watermark means until the fund reaches, breaches the above, the level above, the previously high value, no incentive will be given. So until I breach 120 back, let's say from here, I go to 124. Only then I will get my incentive because now I have crossed 120. Are you getting this? So I'll not get an incentive till I reach back the previous high. Is that clear? Yes. It's a good thing. You know why? Because otherwise many funds will fall again, take incentive, fall again, take incentive. Clear. But in real terms, they are not increasing. Clear. If it, what, if it could yeah. be 117, then definitely. They no. Will. Under no case until it goes 120 and above. The funds value should go above 120. Only then it qualifies for incentive, if any. Mm -hmm. Correct. So, uh, like, as I said, uh, like private equity hedge funds have almost similar structure when it comes to the fees and all, right? So there also you have, uh, you, you have high watermark, you have management fee, incentive fee and clawback and various other provisions. But there are other things also that you need to consider when it comes to an hedge funds. And what are those? Redemptions frequently occur when a hedge fund is performing poorly. So 
the inflow and outflow from the hedge fund is very high. Even if there are restrictions and all, there are the hedge funds volatility is very high because hedge funds, as I said, they invest in derivatives and various other strategies. So the the you know the performance is very much volatile of an hedge funds. In hedge fund industry, a drawdown is a reduction in the NAV. So when the hedge funds investments suffer, there is a fall in the value of the NAV. When drawdowns occur, investor may decide to exit the fund or redeem at least portion of their investments. Redemptions may require hedge fund managers to liquidate or sell off some of the investments, right? And when they sell, because of this, the transaction cost will be suffered by everyone. So this will incur the transaction cost and may further magnify your losses. Redemptions may severely damage and they may also serve, uh, you know, uh, as a as a liquidity issue for the for the hedge fund manager and therefore the hedge fund manager will try to discourage you from redemption by putting up what by putting up some restrictions or notice period clear so notice period may allow the hedge fund manager to liquidate a position in an orderly fashion rather than completely random and increasing the loss is that clear correct now before I tell you what are the valuation related issues, let me actually tell you how the returns are being calculated in hedge funds. And now all the small, small things will come into the play. So do not hurry, do not rush. The return calculation for hedge funds and private equity is almost the same. But here the words that we'll be using is more of hedge fund because hedge fund has more feature. So PQR capital is a hedge fund with 200 million of initial invested capital. Right, they charge two percent management fee on AUM asset under management at the year end. And at so, when do they charge the uh, fee at the end of the year? Okay, not upfront and a 20 percent incentive fee. So, incentive is 20 percent in the first year. PQR has a return of 25 percentage. How much was the fund, by the way? 200, 200, right. Yes, 200. And they give a return of 25%. So when I multiply that with 1.25, I can say the fund's value became 250 by the end of the year. Yes. Correct. So the return was 50. So overall, the fund's value should be 250 at the end. So at the beginning, it was 200. And the end, it became 250. Am I correct? Yes. But, but, but not entire 250 you'll get, right? There will be a lot of deductions. The 2% is the management fee. So the management fee is on what? On asset under management at year end. So at year end's value, how much is the year end value? 250 into 2%, that will be your management fee, which is fixed. And the incentive fee is 20%. Have they told the incentive is above a hurdle rate or something like that? No. That means it is on the entire return, which is a soft hurdle. Are you getting it? Soft hurdle is incentive on the entire returns. Clear? So how much should the incentive be on? 250 minus 200 and 20% on that. Are you getting me? Yes. 10 million would be the incentive. fee. So total fees that you are going to pay is five fixed plus 10 plus as 10. 15 million is the fees that you are going to pay. So on at the end, you will be getting 250 minus the 15 million of fees. You'll be getting 235. So your returns will be 235 on an investment of 200. 200. Do that in your calculator, 235 divided by 200 minus one. You'll be getting a return of 17.5%. Is that clear? Yes. Now see, I will do minor changes in it and be alert. In the second one, hedge funds incentive fees are net of the management fees. Here you calculated the incentive fee on the gross, right? Everyone? Yes. Clear. Now if I do the same, what is going to be the situation here? It was 200 initially, then it became 250. Management fee was 250 into 2 percentage, which was 
five, but now my incentive fee will be how much? How much? Net of so it will be two fifty minus two hundred minus five. Five is also paid, right? So it has to be the net of management fee on this. So my now my incentive will be not calculated on fifty, but on forty five. On this, how much is the incentive? Twenty percent. So it will be slightly less. Are you getting me? Yes. Good for the investors, right? And this should be the way. So the net value that you will get now is two fifty minus fourteen. So that two thirty six divided by two hundred. That's going to be your returns, which is eighteen percentage. Is that clear, everyone? Correct. Everyone, what's the difference? Both are soft hurdles, but in the first case, when they don't mention anything, the incentive is calculated on gross. In the second case, we did calculate it on the net of management fees. Clear? Yes. Now I will introduce hard hurdle. Hard hurdle means you will get incentive, but if you cross some, if you cross some, some hurdle, right? If you cross some minimum returns. So, what are the fees charged if the end, an ending value and investors returns if the fee structure specifies a hurdle rate of five percent, and the incentive fee is calculated net of management fee? Okay, everything else is same. So, the initial investment value was two hundred. The ending value will be was two fifty. Correct. Management fee. Management fee again will be two fifty minus two hundred, and that is how much. Same, right? Management fee won't change. Five percentage was the management fee. Am I correct? Yes. Sir. How much was the management fee? Two percent. Sorry, sorry. Five. Am I doing some mistake? Two percent. Oh, on the ending value, my mistake. Sorry. It was two fifty on the ending value. I'm I'm just getting confused. Huh? Clear. Yes. But the issue is about in the incentive fee. The incentive fee they are saying is only and only if the hurdle rate of five percent. So whatever is the returns above five percent. By the way, what is five percentage on two hundred? So two hundred into five percentage is how much? Ten. Ten. So out of two fifty, I will subtract this. Correct. What I'll subtract? Not only two hundred, but five percent on it. And how do I do that? I will do two hundred into one point zero five. Are you getting why? Yes. And I will also subtract the management fee. Now check it in your calculator. When you do two hundred into one point zero five, what do you get? Two point zero, right? Yes, two one zero, and add five to it. So your value is two fifteen. Yes, that minus two fifty. So your overall value is how much? Thirty five. Thirty five, and twenty percent of that thirty five is going to be your incentive. Make sense? Clear? Because five percent on two hundred was to be achieved. Anything beyond that and beyond the management fee qualifies for incentive, isn't it? Yes. So now my incentive total, my total fees will be five plus seven. It is going to be twelve. So my ending value will be two fifty minus twelve. That is going to be two thirty eight, and two thirty eight divided by two hundred minus one. That will give me nineteen percentage. Just check it if that's correct. Yes. Everyone. So you are now it's a hard hurdle, and net of management fees. So the lesser, the more stricter it becomes, the more returns you will get. Correct, everyone. Yes. Now, just a moment. Yes. Now, in the next part, I'm changing some small thing. I'm going to the second year. So what is going to be the case in the second year? By the way, in the second year, the funds value declined to two twenty million. Okay, what are the fees charged, ending value, and investors' return 
in the second year the fee structure as specified in 2a so in 2a sorry in 2a what was the situation in 2a my ending value was first year how much was it 235 235 so i will take here 235 as my beginning value of the second year clear and they have said that the fee structure is same as the first part but the hurdle rate is of a 5 percentage and the incentive is calculated net of management fee now how much is the fund's value in the second year that they have showed me is 220 20. first of all will i get a management yes management fee is on the ending value how much is it 5 percentage 5 percentage right or 2 percentage how much 2 was percentage 2 sorry so the management fee will be there whether the fund makes profit or loss but will i now qualify for incentive fee no because the fund's value has gone down value is down so the incentive fee will be fee will be zero so the total fee will be 4.4 so my ending amount that i will get is 220 minus 4.4 i'll get 215.6 on the investment of what was my investment at the beginning of the year 200 235 beginning of the first year 235 we are not discussing for the two years yes 235 second year return correct yes why because they have asked me in the second year in the second year not for two years yes it is for second year 235 minus 1 so my returns will be negative 8.26 am i correct yes because the funds value went down clear Yes, I took all the data from two A, added the hurdle rate and the uh, uh, incentive structure also, but it doesn't make incentive because the funds value has gone down. Clear? Everyone? Yes. Anyone? Any questions till now? No. Now we go to the next part. That is, that is, we will also add the high water mark. Do you recollect what was the high water mark provision? What is the high water? It is up. If it is uh, about the hmm. previous previous high value, right? High value, yes. Correct. So before I go to the high watermark provision, tell me what was the value of the fund at initiation? Two hundred. Start. It was two hundred, right? Yes. Then at the end of the first year, the net value at the end of the first year. Two thirty-five. Yes, two thirty-five, right? So yes. then it went to I will write two thirty five. Correct. Now in the second year we got this. How much is the ending value in the second year? Two one five. Two one five point six. So can I say it dropped to two one five point six? So the high water mark is two thirty five. Two thirty five. That's the highest value till date. Yes. Clear? Yes. I will keep that in mind. Now they saying in the third year the funds value increased to two sixty million. Okay, now the funds value has gone to two sixty. So the investment value beginning in the third year can I say is equal to the ending of the second year, which is two one five point six. Correct. Right. And then they are, now they are saying that the value increased to two sixty. The management fee will be two sixty into two percent. Am I correct? Does the fund first of all qualify for incentive? Yes or no? Yes. Why? Because it has breached the high water mark. So it does qualify for incentive. And they have said that the incentive will be above the hurdle rate. And 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 one more thing that they have said. Have they said anything else? What is the incentive structure that they have said? What are the fees charged? Investors' uh, ending value, investors' return. The fee structure is specified in question two A and question two D, but also includes high water mark. So in two A, what was the incentive structure? They have told incentive no. No. Right. In two D, what was the incentive structure? Hurdle rate of five percent. Incentive fees calculated net of management net fees. Of Correct. So, two D and then also includes a high water mark. So, what will be my incentive fee? Let me know. Will it be, will it be above 
uh, some value, right? What is that value about which there will be incentive fees? Tell me that. I'll repeat the incentive structure in 2D, uh, the hurdle rate of 5%, the incentive is calculated net of management fee. Okay. So hurdle rate, hurdle rate. Now, first of all, has the fund breached the high water mark? Yes. yes. The incentive fee, whatever will be calculated only above the high water mark, not from the value of 215 to 216. How much is the change from 215 to 216? Can you find that 260 divided by 215.6 minus one. So it's around 20% change. 20%. But, 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 but I'm going to consider it only about 235. So only about 235 is what it qualifies for incentive. Are you getting my point? Why? Because the fund actually went down. So you can't claim the incentive for that value also. Is that clear? Yes. That was anyway supposed to be achieved because you, you fall in, you, you did drop the value. So only the gains about 235, which was the previous high watermark provision, only that will qualify for incentive. Is that clear? Yes. Correct. So my incentive fee will be, fee will be now over and above 35. 35. So 260 minus 235. And one more thing, what? Management fees. How much should I subtract? Minus, minus 5.2. 5. 5. On this, I will charge the incentive of how much? 20%. That is 3.96. Is that clear? Yes. Why am I not taking incentive on entire 215? Because the high watermark provision says that 235 was anyways to be achieved. So you're not going to get any incentive on that. Only if you breach that and subtract the incentive uh, management fee and whatever is the extra on that, you get 20%. So my total fee is now 5.2 plus 3.96, 9.16. I will subtract that from the ending value 260 minus 9.16. Am I correct? Everyone? So I'll get 250.84 on an investment of 215.60 minus one you do, you'll get a return of 16.35 in this third year. Is that clear everyone? Correct. How much was your return in the first year, by the way? 17.5 positive, right? The return in the second year is in 2D. That's the second year return, which is minus 8.26. And in the third year, it is 16.35. Clear? Right? Yes. So now, what are the arithmetic and geometric mean? You know, arithmetic and geometric mean, right? Yes. Over the three years period, based on the fee structure specified in 2A, 2D, and 2E. What is the... Capital gain to the investor. That's the second part. Capital gain to the investors. And the third part, they have asked me, what is the total fee charged by the fund? Okay. So first of all, what is the first year return? I got 17.5. Correct. The second year return was minus 8.26, if I'm not wrong. And the third year, we got 16.35. Clear? Let's take a simple average of all 17.5 minus 8.26 plus 16.35 divided by 3. That's going to be your arithmetic mean. That is 8.53. Let me know if I'm correct. Yes. Now, geometric mean is slightly equal to or less than arithmetic mean, right? So, geometric mean, I will do bracket 1.175. Multiply with 1 minus 8.26%. That is going to give you 0 0.0.9174, if I'm not wrong. Multiply with 1.1635. Correct? Just check if it's 0 0.9174. <coughs> 974. And this has to be taken the average. So, raised to 1 divided by 3. 
So you do raise to three and then press one by X and then press equal to. Correct. Whatever answer you get, subtract one from it. You'll get this 7.84. Let me know if you don't get the calculation. First of all, you will calculate this entire part. Then yes. you press y x three inverse the three and then press equal to then press minus one. You'll get 7.84 clear. Yes. So what is the total gain that happened to us? What was the ending value after everything? At the end of the third year, can I say it was 250.84? Correct. Yes. And initially you invested 200. 200. Your total capital gain was, I can say 50.84. And what were your fees in the first one? In the first one, it was 50. 50. In the second part, it was 4.4. So I'll write 15 plus 4.4. Am I correct? 4.4, right? And in the third part, yeah. how much was it? 9.16. Clear. So the fee, <laughs> now see the joke here. The hedge fund and the private equity fund managers make more money. So how much return you got in terms of gains? 50.84. And how much is the fees that they made? 28.56. 28.56. That's a substantial fee, right? Yes. You may be wondering that, wow, I got good returns, but they got substantial fees. This is the problem with hedge funds. They have huge amount of fees. Clear because of the incentive and other structures. Is that clear? I'm sure now everything incentive, management fee, high watermark, soft hurdle, hard hurdle, everything is clear. Correct. Yes. Definitely you'll practice this again and you'll get it much clear when you do the written practice here because I'd done the table easily available. So it became very quick and easy. Clear. Now, now we can discuss the two parts of one. We have to do one more calculation, but let us discuss the valuation issues of hedge funds. Now, hedge funds invest in securities, right? So the problem with the valuation issues of securities is that should I take the, when I do the calculation of the valuation of hedge funds investment, should I take the bid price or the ask price of the investments? Okay. That's a confusion. So because the bid price and ask price may have big difference if the securities are not listed, the bid ask spread will be higher. So should I take bid or ask? Some people take the average and some people take bid for long positions and ask for short positions. Clear. So those are the issues that hedge funds do have when it, is, when it comes to valuation. Second, do you recollect something from called survivorship bias? where hedge funds, when they publish the data, yep. they are not mandated, all the hedge funds. So only the successful fund manage, hedge fund managers publish the data. So their data is not reliable because they are not mandated. Second, they invest in securities which are very illiquid, right? They're very riskier. So many times the price is not available. So they estimate the value which they can inflate, correct? And then there are various other risks with respect to hedge funds. So basically hedge funds do have the problems of reliability. Clear. Still people invest in hedge funds, not only in hedge funds, but they make hedge fund as one of their investments. Like you don't put all your money in alternative investment. That is one of your investments because they have the potential for higher returns. And generally it is said that alternative investments overall have low correlation with the other assets. So hedge funds have tended to be better than those of global equities in down market and to lag the returns of global equities in up market. So when the markets are going up, hedge funds are not that great. But when the markets are down, they are saying hedge funds are much better. But yes, it completely depends on which hedge fund you are investing because all the hedge funds have varieties of strategies. So actually, Comparison between two hedge funds of two different strategies is absolutely absurd. Different hedge fund strategies have the best returns during different time periods. 
statements about their performance and diversification are problematic because of great varieties of strategies used clear and they are saying that hedge funds do have less correlation but in the times of crisis hedge funds have shown high correlation so even they go down badly and as far as i remember most of the hedge funds closed on the business during market turmoil only few survive so hedge funds do have a high risk of failure clear everyone so when i will invest in hedge funds like private equity i'll do the due diligence here am i correct so the due diligence will be that i'll check what is the strategy of the fund what are the types of strategy what is the process of investment are there any historical returns available i will have to check that how do the hedge funds do the valuation what is the incentive structure right what is the fee structure we just saw soft hurdle hard hard hurdle and all right how much is the size of the fund is the fund huge in size then that shows me reliability the management style the person involved in managing the hedge fund if the person is very famous like ray dalio then it's a good fund people will rely on that so the reputation of the fund should be good they should pay things on time they should not stop they should not uh, stop the uh, distribution they should regularly distribute the returns that's what the reputation of the hedge fund will be so various other factors you can just simply read it that's what you'll have to take consideration or take care when you invest in hedge funds because you are going to put huge money and they will be locked for a period clear everyone yes now out of the various types of hedge funds which i showed you there are so many types right so many times there is a confusion which hedge fund should i select so in such a case you have a choice which is what we call as fund of fund hedge fund what is a fund of fund hedge fund like a fund of fund mutual fund it collects money from you and invests in variety of hedge funds clear so it not only invests in one hedge fund but invests in a portfolio of hedge funds correct but then there is a problem what can you recollect double fees why because you'll have to pay the fees to the fund of fund also and the fund of fund will pay fees on your behalf for to the to the investments where they do right so are you getting my point if you invest in fund of fund you get diversification but it comes at a cost that you'll be paying up twice the fees your fees will be high are you getting it everyone clear yes yes so we will be discussing what happens in a fund of fund so here's the situation and Uh, you know understand it very carefully basically the fund of fund is always going to out uh, underperform the actual fund now i'm going to compare you two things a hedge fund and a fund of fund which invests in that hedge fund okay for simplicity we'll assume that it invests in only in this hedge fund ideally it invests in variety of hedge funds okay so an investor is considering investment of 200 million in either a pqr hedge fund or m n fund of fund which invests in pqr so either i will invest in pqr 200 million dollar or m n fund which invests in pqr clear clear pqr has a standard 2 and 20 what is 2 and 20 2 is management fees and 20 is incentive incentives clear yes. with no hurdle rate management fees are calculated on an annual basis on aum at the beginning of the year not at the ending so can i say management fees will be 200 into 2% for pqr correct yes this is all about pqr right management fees and incentive fees are calculated independently pqr has a 20% return for the year before management and incentive fees so what is the value of the pqr at the end of the year i will say 200 into 1.2 240 correct what is the incentive fee by the way for pqr incentive fee 20% is right do we have a soft or a harder is there a hurdle rate no so 250 okay. minus 200 on this i will be charged how much 20% am i correct 
that will be my incentive. So the total fees I pay here is four plus eight. I'll be paying up $12 as fees. So my ending value here will be 240 minus 12. I'll get 228. 228 on 200 is what I'll getting. I'll be getting 14 percentage. Am I correct? Just check it, the calculation. But now what about MN? MN has a fee of uh, 1% and 10% fee structure. So how much is the management fee of MN? 200 into 1 percentage, right? So I'll be paying $2 in MN fund of fund. And 10% fee structure, 10% on incentive, right? How much yes. is ending value of MN fund? Very important. MN fund is investing in PQR. So how much will MN get at the end? It will get 228. Are you getting it? Yes. And now if I calculate the incentive fee, it will be 228 minus 200 on that 20%. So I'll be paying 5.6. So basically I'll be paying a total fees of 2 plus 5.6. I'll be paying 7.6. But that will be subtracted from 228 and eventually I'll get 220.4 only 220.4 on an investment of 200, which is definitely less than the actual fund. And I will get 10.2 percentage of returns. I may get excess diversification, but that comes at an excess cost. Is that clear? Everyone. Correct. Right. What is the situation here? Two, oh, did we do some mistake? Sorry, sorry. It's 10 percentage. MN's incentive is 10 percentage. My mistake. This is 10 percentage. Okay. So this has to be 2.8. Sorry, sorry. So this has to be. I just missed that. 2.8. Don't do mistake like me. So 4.8. Sorry. So 220 minus 4.8. 228 minus 4.8. 2. 23.2. So I'll just do your two 23.2. And this will give me 11.6. 11 so this will be 11.6. Remember the 20% is for PQR. MN fund of fund charges 10%. 10%. Okay. It's slightly less, but still overall there is a big gap between returns because MN is eventually investing in PQR. And therefore, there are double fees. But here we have hypothetically assumed that it invests in only one fund. Ideally, it invests in a variety of funds. So you have a chance of higher return and lower risk. Clear? Everyone? Yes. So what all we have covered till now? Till we have covered, till now we have covered what is alternative and traditional investment, the characteristics and the various categories of alternative investments. Of that, we discuss private equity and hedge funds till now. Is that clear, everyone? Correct. So for no. the funds, yeah, go ahead. Uh, for the funds, uh, funds of funds, the, yeah. uh, who are the investors? Like, well, uh, so like an investor like me, I'm not sure where to invest. Which hedge fund should I invest? So I may easily to start with, I may buy a fund of fund hedge funds, right? Because I'm confused which hedge fund to invest, what is their strategy, every hedge fund has different strategy. So all those who are not sure of which one particular hedge fund they should pick up and they want more diversification, they will of course go for fund of fund. So these are all conservative investors. They want more diversification, lesser risk. That's the only investor. So they don't mind paying that extra fee. Clear? Yes. By the way, that's the same concept in mutual fund also. In mutual fund also, we have fund of fund mutual funds. So it's diversification and more diversification correct yes clear till this point yes well now what we are going to cover up in the next part is real estate commodities and infra investments and various other types of alternative investments clear everyone any doubts till this point well that's it from my end the other part of alternative will be covering up in the next section. Clear? Yes. Okay.
that's it enjoy the day we'll meet tomorrow okay thank you yeah bye bye